Hi, my name is Jane Mulcahy. Welcome to Law and Justice. This is a special series on the topic of how to talk policy and influence people. And today I'm really thrilled to be joined by Stevie G. Stephen Granger uh, is, I guess, his formal name, but Stevie G is a DJ, a writer, a record hoarder, producer, promoter, and he also steers a youth project at the Cork Migrant Centre, according to your Twitter account. So, um, Stevie, thanks for joining me. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Delighted to be here. So, uh, as you can see, it's a beautiful sunny day here. Yeah, you know, it's, it's glorious in the River Lee. Yeah, I uh, love the backdrop. Um, Stevie, can you tell me a bit about yourself and your background before we kind of talk about the Migrant Centre project, please? Yeah, so basically, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm a DJ is what I do, but it's connected to loads of stuff, whether it's writing, uh, producing of a label, uh, very low key, small, small time label. And I work on radio. I used to work part. I used to work full time on radio for many years for about I've been I've been with Red FM in Cork for 20 years it's next year, I think. And I did pirate radio like everyone else before that. Um, and I run nights, do festivals, all that kind of thing. So it's all really connected to the DJ. Uh, even the stuff we are going to talk about is all connected to that. So it's all music related. Um, so that's it. Yeah, I, I like like a lot of people when I left college, um, I was just doing a bit of DJ in college. And, and next okay. thing I, I know, um, I was kind of just doing it full time and working in record shops and stuff. And it was the 90s, you know, so record yeah, yeah. shops and uh, and the, the scene was pretty good as well. So um, uh, the club scene, we'll say, which is obviously um, on its knees at the moment. But even before the pandemic, it was kind of um, it was struggling. But, um, but yeah, I ended up just doing that. No, I did a couple of diversions. Like I ran a venue with two other people for seven years okay. in Cork, the Pavilion, uh, which is a, was, a, it was an amazing venue, uh, two um, a bar downstairs and a club upstairs and loads of other stuff as well. But I, I would just consider myself, I guess, a DJ. And that's what I've been doing since I left college and whatever it was, the mid 90s. Right. Well, I actually know your sisters. I was at school with your sisters. So before I actually heard your music, I kind of knew who you were. And okay. they used to talk about hip hop and they were way ahead of their time. They got it from you, I guess, because I was listening to Celine Dion and other kind of cheesy um, people. Whitney Houston was about as cool as I got in the, in, in the mid nineties. But um, so anyone of my age or, or loads of people I, I'm sure who are into hip hop would know of you, know you, but I remember you from your DJing days in the back bar in Sir Henry's. And yeah, that's right. A, a lot of hip hop then. Yeah. How did you get into hip hop as a white boy from Cork in the nineties? Yeah, so it would have been the end of the eighties when I would have got into it as a okay. teenager. Now, my musical grounding would have been like anyone growing up in the 80s as a kid. Like, I'm in my 40s, so it would have been like Michael Jackson, Prince, right. Madonna, all the good pop stuff. Yeah. And then there was a lot of stuff that cr crossed into the, the tin line between pop and more left centre. So even, even if the guys, the, the people I, I named, lots of them were quite experimental with music. Like, Prince is one mm -hmm. of the... Amazing. Arguably the greatest artists of all time. So... So I would have subconsciously been getting into soulful music then, but it was very subconscious because I, I was like, just this is just music. Who, who, who knows anything? But <laughs> the first the first alternative music I got into was stuff like The Clash, okay. even The Cure. Got really into punk as a teenager. But I always felt that uh, I missed it. So for anyone in Cork, it would have been like those people who hang out in Paul Street who, 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 who wished Kurt Cobain was around. <laughs> they still have the Nirvana teacher. But, but they felt that they were 20 years too late. And it was yeah. like that for me with punk. But then hip hop came and it was it was the same. Now, a lot of the, the, the philosophies of the music, like um, with punk was quite, even though some of the, the wrong people tried to latch onto it, it was very much about what was right. I mean, I didn't really have any political views, but at the same time, I always knew I thought what was right and wrong and lots of I got good grounding now there was some there was one or two contradictions from some of the artists um, and there was a lot of debate even amongst those artists but I was getting this music 10 years after it was out mm -hmm. but I was really interested in it 
at, at a time when I would have been in school learning about history and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and just being a teenager and curious. So but when hip hop came, it was really the one for me. Now, I had even more kind of conflicts because first of all, the, f- the first wave of it, because hip hop was novelty music in the 80s to most people, especially white people in, mm. in Cork. Um, um, but I, so I had c- certain conflicts with some of the music I liked, especially the women. I could never, I was never into that. And punk and fairness was quite right on in that regard. So there was certain stuff with hip hop, but then I delved into it. And at, the, at, at a time when I was like, um, whatever, 14 or 15, a lot of really kind of right on groups came out like Della Soul and Tribe Called Quest and stuff, who ended up becoming the sort of sound that I developed as a DJ later. Um, so these guys weren't much older than me. Um, and there was girls as well, then lots of people like Queen Latifah, MC Light. Um, so to be honest, the music, which anyone into rap was always defending it against everything. Um, but this came to a time, so the political groups like Public Enemy, mm. but then the more, I don't know how you'd say it, like it was a bit less, I, I guess you could even say that these were kind of a, almost like middle-class Americans living in Long Island and places like that. It wasn't, like I still love the real street stuff, mm-hmm. but some of it was like, I treated it like Hollywood, you know what I mean? Mm. Now some people are into rap, treat it like, but like for me, it was just like, no, some of it was actually real. Like what, what was happening on the streets was real. But like, like even though I was interested in it, I wanted to know what was happening in America or whatever. Like, but, but like in Cork, you know, it wasn't like someone shooting up some, yeah. some whatever. It wasn't the same kind of, the same, <laughs> the same vibe on the streets here, thankfully. But the sort of the music that really started talking to me, um, with, with people like Dallas Oler and Tribe Called Quest, Jungle Brothers, and loads of stuff like that, and all the the, the women rappers at the time, uh, that really made a big thing for me, and it got me into soul and jazz through sampling and all this stuff. But the big thing what happened is again, hip hop was becoming a bit too macho in the nineties. But when I started DJing, a new wave just happened at the exact same time, which is people like Lauren Hill. Uh, their right. first album did nothing, but when she came out. Um, and then she eventually went solo, and then D'Angelo came out, Erica Badu later, Jill Scott, uh, Mary J. Blige had been there all through my DJ mm. sort of career. But the 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 uh, the female side of it uh, ended up becoming my sound, so I was married to the the beats were the same, but it was more of a a, a girl perspective, right. woman perspective, and that was the sound I developed as as a DJ. And that was the angle, to be honest, I had and still have, I suppose, because. Certain people in rap were like a bit like this is a bit too kind of like early or whatever. But I was always very early days uh, embracing that, and and to be honest, it definitely made it uh, it changed the mood of uh, like because even today I love hip hop, but like mm. listening to rap for three hours a bit can be a bit especially at the time. Now it's different now because like half of the best selling rappers are, are women, mm. but um, but but then it was just because I wanted something to to bring a bit more of a soulful vibe so that's my that's my thing to this day and all of those artists that i played back then i still play their music and i've dj with some of them and got got to meet loads of them and so i've been lucky really but um that's the, that's how the evolution happened i guess fair enough yeah it's it, it's it's very interesting um one thing that has struck me you kind of uh, mentioned there that life in Ireland in the 90s was quite different to the culture around hip hop in the States. But I've met people from various backgrounds now, often kind of um, more, I suppose, deprived communities in Ireland and elsewhere where it's mainly white people, but hip hop seems to speak very much to these communities as well. And I think we've got our own homegrown um, hip hop coming out that has this urban thing to it what why do you think hip-hop speaks to to people in in um in more deprived communities is it about social injustice and kind of oppression and a a way of ventilating emotions creatively or or why do you think it appeals like tupac is is huge still in 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 many communities and even lynn ruan the senator mentioned he was the backdrop to her teens in tala or Mm -hmm. kilnarden it's universal. I mean, yep. 
when I was saying that, like, to be honest, right, right when I was a teenager, this was speaking directly to me. Like, I didn't have to be, like, you know, look what I mean from, like, I was just from a normal area or whatever. Yeah. I wasn't, like, the poverty stricken, yeah, sure. blah, blah, blah. But uh, it, it was direct to me. So it talked exactly direct to me. Now, I was into all the arts, literature, into everything. But there was nothing as direct. That I mean, Chuck D of Public Enemy, who I've interviewed a lot of times, was calling it a black people CNN. Right. And this was the direct line. This is how I, even in college, I studied um, civil rights in Ireland and America. And also I did a lot of stuff on censorship. And to be honest, it was hip hop that, that, that taught me everything about, uh, about all of that stuff. And um, right now it's actually happening because the, the scene has been celebrated more in Ireland because uh, our, our domestic rappers are being they're getting media coverage you know that we're always there but this the whole street level thing is first of all it's not high art i guess right and anyone can do it that's how it started in the parks where the people just had their voice and if you want to take it really way back when people had migrated uh to america one of the only things they could have was their voice right um so this went to cotton fields it went to whatever and the same i mean um, I know Irish people have gone around the world as well, but not in the same way, you know what I mean? We weren't um, um, slaves. Yes. In America, particularly, you can hear the echoes in hip-hop. If you go back to jazz blues, which is the, the fun, fun foundation, but you can hear the, the voice of, I suppose, the voice of resistance, the voice of, uh, you can hear all the, the, the impressive stuff. Uh, if you go way back to Mahalia Jackson or anyone like that, or obviously Billy Holiday would be one of my favorites, mm -hmm. Bessie Smith, but you could hear the pain in, in, in the music. Uh, so it's it's just like, it's it's a long evolution, but I think it's always been something from the streets. It's it's one of the, the bite back things. It's a kind of like, it's, it's a rebellion thing as well. Like lots of people my age don't like the new hip hop, which I'm actually really into. I love yeah. all the, uh, lots of the new stuff. No, some of the stuff I'm obviously kind of going up. But I appreciate that like hip hop has always been a young kind of form of music, even though ironically it's based on respect for older music. Mm. Um, no, it's different these days because it's not as sample based as it used to be because of uh, litigation and stuff like that. And, uh, and we all know what America's like in that regard. Mm. But, um, and the music industry as a whole. But I, I think it resonates literally on a street level because it's just so direct into people and it's you can say uh like i had a writing workshop last night with kids and we were asking them to write down i say a feeling one of the best feelings or the worst feelings they had of the year write a couple of words down and they all started telling stories and they only had a minute each but each time i wanted to hear more so i yeah. got the story straight away Whereas with more abstract art, you know, it can take a bit more. So I think this is for everyone. It's very, it's for the entry level is pretty easy. I mean, hip hop was seen as a novelty, as I say, when it was in the 70s or 80s being born. But like, this is the, if you look at the way it's influenced fashion, the way it's influenced even humor or anything else, it's it's like hip hop is the direct line to, to, to people. So I think that's one of the reasons why it resonates. I mean, yeah. it's just so direct, I think, and it's unfiltered, I guess, as well. Yeah. And it, I mean, it, it can, some of it can be quite angry, but in a powerful way, like fight the power is mm. as relevant now, if not more so in this very day than when it was written. Um, Absolutely. And just the rhyming, like the, the wordsmithery that can be there, the, the mind boggling capacity to move your mouth so quickly, like, from a performance actually, perspective is amazing. Yeah, actually. And if you look at the best rappers of 2020, it's the same, whether it's Kendrick Lamar or whoever else will be very much aligned to Chuck D and Public Enemy. But in Ireland, that's one of the things that kind of was always there because we are wordsmiths. Yeah. So it was always, so it should have been the perfect storm for Ireland that we've got the, the influence of the UK on one side and America on one side. And we've got this massive, uh, Gifted a Gab, and there's a rapper I know called Gifted a Gab who's a black American, <laughs> black delicious. But anyway, this Gifted a Gab thing is something we've always had. And now in 2020, it's finally, whether it's because of media coverage and some artists are evolving, 
but we've got like Denise Chyla here, we've got Mango and Batman, we've got Kojak, we've got JLOL, we've got we got we've got millions of rappers here. And we've got that whole um, kind of uh, and a lots of like because I always look at spoken word as the same thing. If you look yeah. at the founding fathers and mothers of hip hop, like the Elf Got Heron or whatever. But we've got our versions now, like Denise Child and people like that, like God knows, uh, Merley. So it's just, um, yeah, it's just like the whole, even as you just said, the words alone. I mean, there's so much what what you can do, and and also you don't have to when you when you bring it back to how come it comes from a kind of a situation from poorer communities or wherever else. It's just you you don't have to have anything. You, you don't have to buy an electric guitar or you don't yeah. even have to buy decks you can beatbox you can you can beat on a, a pan or whatever you can get so that's why two the two big loves in my life artistically music and uh, and soccer are, are both of those things that they don't require the entry level and that's why a lot of it does come from that sort of street level you know what i mean mm-hmm. um so it's it's quite interesting see, seeing how how it evolves but anyone can do it really yeah uh which is cool it's very cool yeah um because so many of the other arts are cut off maybe from from or people don't have the opportunities or maybe might be a bit daunted about even trying kind of like it's not for me um there was a, a tweet recently by the irish penal reform trust who i used to work for they linked um this guy Nyler. i hadn't heard of him but it was mm-hmm. basically a a, a a rap about you know um, stats and numbers are, are just that until they're your life and it was very interesting because the rap brought in all these reports about poverty and deprivation and addiction and mental health issues and suicide and and just the fact that certain communities are overrepresented sadly in these statistics and it was it was quite powerful just using data Mm. Um, as as a force to express anger at the inequity and lack of government investment you know it was uh, it had yeah. been to my knowledge before literally to have stats popping up in the screen and pictures of the reports but it was kind of um it wasn't neither the blogger no uh, well, Nine. yeah neither the blogger and then i can't um it then, was a rapper okay right, yeah, I get right. It. um yeah and actually um i've seen people use even simple stuff like stats. I mean, it's even when it comes to performance, uh, you can say stuff, you can, sometimes you can rant or you can be Bono or whatever, uh, but sometimes it can be more effective. Like I've seen that in a live performance and even some of the stuff I've done myself, sometimes I've seen Massive Attack do it really well, obviously over the years, they, they just have a screen. And even when they're played in Cork, which has happened many times, They'd have a screen with stats about direct provision. They even when the, the repeal campaign was on oh, here, right. which I was a- actively involved in, they had stuff that was relevant to here. And it wasn't just uh, a UK band coming in talking about Tony Blair or whoever. It was yeah, yeah. a UK band and they were actually relevant to to the audience they were playing to. And they're, they're like words are, are powerful, you know, and there's different ways of using them if, if you can't like we actually just did a project with the, with the kids, which I'll be talking about in a while, um, uh, an artistic project where their words uh, became as powerful as the art. Like some of them are artists and visual artists and photographers and uh, they can draw on this, but some of them, it was just to get their words yeah. and to write their words. Uh, and even on the screen that night, I can always remember that Massive Attack show when they were talking about some of the stuff that was happening in would say Afghanistan and even they were because people were gasping in the audience when they had some stats about repeal here and I know if they were here tomorrow they'd be talking about direct provision or whatever yeah. and it's um it's it's cool like words are powerful that's why we need the right people to be using them or we need them to be used in the right way you know what I mean like I was always um in, in college I, I did loads of stuff about censorship and I'd studied it and through musical history it was interesting that lots of the stuff that they were they were going at was not only rap, but it was people like Prince. And the, the common line was that it was black artists, whereas there was, say, lots of white rock stuff, which is very uh, problematic uh, from uh, everything from paedophilia to, to whatever else yeah. was kind of ignored. And this is the, a thing in history, but my view on censorship is, was always kind of like, especially with music, it was about, but 
but it, over the last few years, then there's other stuff that's that's developed. You know what I mean? That like, like I don't think that uh, people spread spreading hate should be platformed or whatever. Yes. And I know people that have been yeah. So it's just like there's a lots of other um, there's lots of other contradictions, but it's interesting. But words, as we know, are are so powerful. And that's why the essence of why rap is is so. Um, important and will always be i guess it's probably the most globally uh, uh big uh, musical form now uh, which is which is incredible really when you think of where it's come from it is indeed um you mentioned the spoken word link there and one of my big interests from my research is around trauma and now also racial trauma but how um finding your voice and using your voice and claiming space and making people hear there's something quite empowering in that you know that there's, there can be a a form of therapy certainly from the spoken word end but i imagine also possibly from rap you know that you oh, absolutely get, you get to define yourself and your experience and make people listen yeah any music i mean you mentioned uh tupac right and yeah. back at, back in the day when his music was coming out i was like like I didn't think Tupac was the best or anything, but the one thing he's done is that that few people have done in in world music history is is he's kind of like people connected with him, right? So he had this power, right? and I'm listening to his stuff now, and you listen to that song "Changes," which is mm. which was written in the early '90s, and it does resonate more than it ever did. But even though there was other people probably even better than him at the time, he is this thing that like he got into like. You know the posters are on teenagers now are kids and it's like bob marley right it's yeah. a universal thing and it's the same way that like and in, it's funny because music is like lots of music journalism over the years is written by white middle-aged men right mm. and if you look at like there's some brilliant magazines but still going i know magazines are almost like gone now but there's the same mojo magazine in england it's really good music magazine but if you look at mojo every month it's like the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, uh, The Who or somewhere on the cover of it. Every so often they might have prints or whatever, but like it's it's very kind of white, male, blah, blah, blah. But if you look at um, the lights, of, like, the, if, if, if you go down to, if you go into the deepest parts of Asia or Africa or South America, Tupac and Bob Marley are it's bigger so than the true. Beatles there, you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> and it's, incre so it's incredible how these people resonate. Yeah. But to have that universal thing of, of being able to connect to it, um, but but what like okay. I know people, like low like I, I've worked with loads of people from the we we'll say the inner city here as well as the from direct provision migration and other different traumas that are, are going on and the amount of people like Tupac or people like that like it's just like and even their own versions are even like you don't it, it mightn't be listening to Tupac it could be writing your own stuff down yeah. as you said and like it does help like just totally um to, to cope with any and people have coped with, with some amazing stuff and, and they, they continue to do so but music and any kind of arts or any kind of escape even mm. or, or even just any kind of expression uh, right. can help, even just talking, you know what I mean? Mm. I mean, you know more about that than me, though. Mm. But a lot of actually what some of the trauma therapists are telling us is that narrative forms of storytelling, you know, and being good at something. So if it's being good at drama or good at hip hop or good at writing, that is healing in and of itself, <laughs> but also being heard, having you listen and go, that's amazing, tell me more, you know, that's that's just really good. Absolutely. But let's shift gears um, briefly and then we'll come back to the project with the young people. So you used to be DJing like live all the time, obviously, mm. before the pandemic. And I presume you can't do that now, unfortunately, because of mm. sort of ish. Well, the big gigs are gone for now anyway. It, it, since March, we've been mm. more or less locked down. Have you um, have you found COVID-19 very difficult Um because of not being able to DJ in front of large crowds, TV. Yeah, I, it's weird because I went through a kind of um, 
like I on March the 11th, I did the electric picnic launch. Right, we were the final act at the launch, so like you're playing to like 500 people, it's packed, and we we knew something was going to happen, like, but like that was it, then it was gone. So I had like my festival season, everything was booked, some really big gigs this summer, blah blah blah. But for whatever reason, overnight, I just kind of like first of all I accepted it right and second of all I just kind of um I kind of realized like people were like oh a week or two I kind of knew straight away and even right. now people are talking about December and March and I've kind of almost like I'm kind of ready for this is a long-term thing but right okay they're going to be the same again so first of all accepting it well and also I always just kind of like roll with the punches so literally that week I did uh, some team I did some stuff here in the kitchen but literally my daughter she was like she was um the host and my son was dancing so we did Lovely. loads of kids we yeah. did loads of kids stuff I've always wanted to do stuff from home anyway and um, DJing stuff because I have a massive studio of millions of records but like it's not really equipped because my internet in the attic wasn't strong right, it was right. so there's loads of stuff that I've had to but literally I just was doing tons of online stuff for the first couple of months of the lockdown and then once things the lockdown finished and now I haven't really been doing much gigs and such, but I do like a very active uh, social media wise and I finally set up my studio that's it's equipped to do stuff now, even stuff like multiple cameras and all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. just to just to make it a bit more. But the other thing is I work on Red FM every Friday and Saturday, which is a DJ show. So yeah. I literally just bring in my decks. So I was just kind of not as busy. But I'm definitely financially been a disaster, like I'm not gonna lie. But I was just always been been active. And then we did loads of other projects with mm-hmm. kids over the summer. So I've just been as active. And to be honest, you're not next to the people, but uh I've still done lo- and I've done lots of virtual like online stuff. So it's not like that it's not a huge miss in that regard, but it has been. And the lockdown brought other situations which were it came at a bad time for me in, in, in other ways. Right. But uh, but to be honest, uh, you just have to, and like, you look at the, like, you know, like I live in, we're very lucky to be living here in Cork or whatever, you know, it's just like yeah, I know. parks everywhere. And, yeah. You know, so, it, well, like when I saw it. some of the footage in, in Italy and stuff, which is still on my mind, like, and when I see stuff that's happened, people I know, that's it. You're just kind of like, yeah. let's be real here no, yeah. you know I, mean? no I, I, I feel you there and also I think as a parent you have to focus on other people as well other than your own needs or wants I yeah. guess <laughs> with kids you know having yeah. been under our feet for a while it makes it all different and I suppose you discussed new opportunities and ways of doing things but I imagine yeah. all the same for anyone who's involved in a kind of live performance element. There's an energy you get from an audience that. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Like, I love, I love it. Like, I, I love being in a packed club or fe- festivals. And like, I love the boss. I, I do loads of stuff with teenagers, with kids. I do people, older stuff. Now, there's like the club scene has been um, in, a, in a perilous situation for a long time anyway. And I was trying to do more, which is like, stuff I do with the, the migrant centre, etc. Mm. So it's kind of forced me to, to to push on a little bit more and to, to get even to get myself up to speed technically with certain stuff that's online. Right. But it's kind of how do I say it was kind of a moment that I was gonna have to change anyway. Now right. the timing was still bad because it was the start of festival season. And yeah. as I say like my income is has been whatever. But as I say, you know, I'm still here. I'm still working in music and with people, working with people actually. Because yeah, like even because people keep saying, like even what you just said, I said, do you miss the people? But well, I'm kind of working with more people, probably even as many people as I would normally. Right. It's online, so yeah. I suppose I'm still getting that like kind of interaction. And I know some people are just in a, in a room all day, um, not talking to anyone. I'm yeah. literally with, and even I, I, like I'm on social media all the time too. So. It's easy so enough well for me, connected. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I'm not like I'm still having the fun, but obviously, you do miss with with, with people like and that, that kind of extra fun. And even when I go to the office and read at them, like I only get in there at night when there's no one really around. But right. I went out to call up to get something in the day, and I walk in, and there's no one there. And it's just, <laughs> yeah. So weird. And so, 
how do people work in those environments who are used to like the, yeah. the crack or whatever so yeah well, I mean I've never worked in a club but I used to do theater and so mm. I know you need an audience is an amazing thing um and I miss like I I haven't been to a club in a long time but I do miss bars I miss restaurants I miss mm. just the normal stuff of life and as you say it could be a long time coming around again but do you think that the government from um you mentioned your own depleted income from the lack of, of of these gigs and stuff. Has the government done enough to support the arts and performers oh. during the yeah. pandemic, do you think? Okay, I'm in a kind of a weird situation because I was in a bar, or we had a, a, a bar at a restaurant, or sorry, not a, well, it was a restaurant too, but it was a venue and stuff. And like, there's different people here who've got like, um, how do I say, um, um, but oh, uh, it hasn't come to me. But anyway, yeah, lobby groups. Yeah. So pubs in Ireland are massive, but they never represented us because we were a club. Pubs don't care what happens late. They just care about like, and it was all volume. So I gave up drink at the time and I was also having certain difficulties even when I was in the bar of like that, like your whole business model is based on trying to volume and getting people drunk and now obviously doing it responsibly. Yeah. Now I firmly believe that venues and stuff like this should be open much later, like clubs should be. Yeah. It will solve a lot of the problems, the social problems, because no matter what happens, if you're you back mean at through the house, night, through the night yeah, stage. Yeah, like, like in the UK, like yeah. I used DJ in the UK and I was playing in Manchester, playing in a bar till one, and we used to get a train down to my friend's club at Leeds, and he was DJ, and we'd be there till four, and the club was open till six, and some people would, st would be drifting out at two or yeah, three yeah. or four. Some people would, like, uh, couples would score with each other or people would be too drunk or, and, and the taxis were all smooth people yeah. were eating outside and the, the fast food places were, were smooth because it wasn't all the same hitting the streets at the same time and yeah the, and I was getting a train from Leeds to Manchester and you could have a beer on it I, I, yeah. I forget what the laws were so <laughs> this is so I'm like this is smooth like what's yeah. and in Cork nice. or in Dublin yeah. Everyone was going onto the streets at the same time, causing trouble, going back to house parties. Then from the, the drug and alcohol thing is is a free for all. Uh, we've all we all know that um, the stats with domestic violence mm. through the lockdown have gone mm. even more. Like I work with the Sexual Violence Centre here in Cork on loads of stuff and I see some of the stuff going on. And like so for me, um I'm not into this nanny state thing at mm. all. I think the government who are like a like they're just PR merchants anyway half the time they've done a lot of good stuff here compared to other countries when it when it comes to the COVID thing I'm not like as I say I don't have a kind of a lobby you know the bars here are a massive thing and they, they came back too early and it's, it's the same in the UK blah 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 it's to, to do with lobbying and powerful interests and, mm. and it's so entwined here even with when it comes to tax revenues with it's in people's interest here to, yes. to sell drink yeah our whole our whole um, marketing is on the drink and the crack and all that. And then it kind of does really annoy me that like when it comes to like late nights, it's almost seen as being a, um, this kind of thing. It's almost like that whole Thatcher attitude to when, when to nightclubs and to, to even my other passion is football. <laughs> Yeah, like they, they treated people who were interested in football or they treat people who are interested in nightclubs as being some sort of, sort of like aliens or whatever, troublemakers. When yeah. in reality, now obviously a lot of bad people do attach themselves to, to, to both football and music, but in reality, it's it's almost like I don't know, it's, it's, just, it's just a bit frustrating. But now the government have come in and they've supported some venues. Uh, in the last week or two, and I know venues that I've been talking to myself, it's it's, it's saving their asses. Uh, yeah. It's giving them a lifeline, so that's good. Um, there's different arts groups, mostly high art, I will admit. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully, some of the funding will like it's it's just something that I'm kind of crap with anyway. But hopefully, some of it will will run into the projects that we're doing because I do think the the um um anything to do with um. Um, racial awareness and stuff is finally on the agenda. Yes. Sadly, it took the George Floyd thing to happen, but like it is kind of still on the agenda. And and here, it's the same as anywhere. Like the news cycle moves, and 
And I was trying to tell the people I work with, like that the agenda, you have to strike while the iron's hot. So the people are actually looking for funding at all that. It's everyone's like the amount of people, even in media that I know, who've been approaching me in the last few months and oh, do you know any like black people I can get to, to do this or whatever? And I'm like, but at the same time, you've got to, got to, got to use yes. the new cycle to your advantage sometimes. Yeah. But um, for me personally, um, I'm just going to go with the flow, but they supported it a little bit. Uh, they've tried to do something anyway, more than I would have thought. Yeah. But like there's, there's other simple stuff that has been on the agenda for years or that's been, that, that's been ignored for years that, that could change things. Like Cor- or, sorry, Ireland markets itself have been tourist, blah, 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 fought to Ireland, this, that, drinking, crack, great fun. And you're still in a nightclub, you've been told to cl- close at like quarter to two or two yeah. o'clock or whatever. So that doesn't make any sense. No. Well, from a community safety point of view, as you say, and reduced injuries and, and just yeah. reduced tension on the streets, there's a lot to... Um, to to support it from other jurisdictions i'd agree with you having experienced it myself um so stevie tell me a bit about this youth project with the migrant young people that you're involved in and how did it come about yeah the midday sun's about to, to lash on to me there no? <laughs> yeah you're nice um, right so i was always doing workshops and stuff no for me I was always doing stuff with anyone interested in music. So I did this thing on Red FM for years called Teenage Thursdays, where there's teenage groups coming up, and I wrote a simultaneous article at the Echo about them, uh, amplifying younger people, whether it was music, rap, whatever. At one stage there, and when that, that Eminem movie came out, everyone wanted to become a rapper. Before that, in the 90s, everyone wanted to become a DJ. And no time for in the last 10 years, loads of kids want to be producers as well. And there's loads of other stuff they can do now. There's more people into fashion, to modeling, to even videos. You can do stuff now on a phone. It's yeah. like incredible. So I was always doing stuff. And obviously in the, like say, like 98, 99, when the first proper migration happened to Ireland, I know there's been a history of migration and we're at Ireland. And, do you know what I mean? We've always had massive uh, influence of cultures, but... It was the first time where economically people were literally escaping this to go to Ireland, which was suddenly uh, seen as being a, and the Irish government dealing with this in a kind of like, let's not make people too comfortable. Number one, we don't want the expense and also not having the knowledge probably and thinking in an Irish way that people do that this thing will go away because this was a big change in the dynamic from yeah. us going to to America or England or wherever else and they did this whole direct provision thing which is like literally just putting people into the, this holding area and just stripping them of their rights and dignity and blah 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 but to cut a long story short um, Ireland Ireland changed over this era and I was always involved in the music so it was obvious that I'd be working uh, on a multicultural level like you know what I mean uh, with like the kids of the people who were here and the people who were here themselves uh, coming to make a new home here and the music I was interested in obviously if, if I'm interested in hip hop that means I'm interested in jazz and blues and mm. the African origins the Jamaican origins so it's a natural thing that I was going to be working with lots of um, people from who are coming to Ireland and then about five years ago or sorry three or four years ago the Cork Migrant Centre, who've been doing lots of good work here on a community level since the early, since around that era. Uh, they're based in Ananega Place, so they called me in and they said, look, we're trying to steer some projects. We'd like you to do the youth project. Now, it's only been vol- voluntary, but uh, we've developed it into something quite big over the three years, and now there's one or two funding things happening too, so I'd be, I'd, like, I'd like to actually do that as a, as a career as much as the other stuff right. because I can do it hand in hand but like lots of it has been voluntary but at the same time it's been a brilliant project and uh, artistically and other other um yeah like I've got a lot out of it myself so, yeah because I, I never want to look at it like some sort of like charity thing this is community stuff it's not because even I see even the tone here that like people even approach me and they're like People are so far removed from, so so many people mean well, 
but there's a bit of the white saviour thing in our lanes and elsewhere. And we've always had it. Like we were always boasting that we were the people who gave loads of money to Live Aid or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And where did the money trickle down to and blah, blah, blah. Now, lots of well-meaning stuff happens here. And like, people come up to me going like, well, oh, look, I've got... Like, I'm trying to tell them that the people we're working with aren't, like, this sort of, you know, the whole media info, um, um, the media impression of Africa. People think it's, like, st- starving kids with, with no clothes and stuff. And it's like, guys, this isn't the support that's needed. No, that is needed in certain areas, too. But I'm just saying, there's a, this is people who are, who are living here. And lots of the other support could be emotional or other uh, educational supports and but there's um, stuff in the system, like, you know, I might be able to express it well, but there's lots of um, other things that, that, that are needed to, to, make, uh, to make the things better, really. And then the project itself, so does it, it, does it involve music and DJing or stuff around integration and belonging or all of Absolutely. Things? Everything, yeah. So it started off with literally me at uh, about 10 girls who were just looking at me and uh, <laughs> nothing was happening. And I was trying to DJ and talk to them and stuff. And and they were lovely. everyone was lovely. And we met a couple of times and nothing was happening. Then I played music. I was trying to get them rapping, singing. Everyone was shy. Nothing was happening. And then eventually got them kind of dancing a little bit. And I got a girl in, uh, Kate Wang from UCC. She was a, a student up there who was teach, a dance teacher who I knew. And she came in and she taught them for a while. Then my friend at the time, Andrea, was their dance teacher for a while. And we got we developed a load of a dance group. Uh, and then, but the, the real power happened then when, because I was doing all the music and the mixes and stuff, but the real power happened in the last, say, 15 months that we did. We did uh, cross community workshops with GMC Beats here in the cabin and not the Haney. Uh, which were uh, a mixture of the kids from up there and the kids from where our people are from, either migrant communities, direct provision, or people seeking refugee status or whatever. And we ended up um, just doing like music, producing music, singing, rapping. We've done a few of those uh, camps since. And at the same time, we did, lo- like the Glucksmith have been doing loads of uh, community stuff with particular people from a migration background. And we did like a brilliant art project with an artist there, Shane O'Driscoll, who's painting the streets at the moment here. So yeah, we did yeah. change, the, change the beat with him. And we did a little film, we got into the film festival. Then this year, as a reaction to um, George Floyd, we did a Black Lives Matter artwork on the front of Nano Negro, which is still there. And then we did My Generation during the summer, which is we got loads of them involved in that. We did two huge, big art projects. One of them is on the city library at the moment, and one of them is in Carl Ski and this hoarding. So we've done loads and loads and loads. Some of them are rapping, singing, we're doing workshops with that. We've gone down to the centres, which we can't do at the moment. Mm. We've got a girl, one of our students, who we could see straight away as a born teacher and leader. She's like about 15, and she's teaching some of the other younger kids dance choreography down there in oh, Mill Street. And we're trying to like support it in other ways. So there's tons of stuff going on. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but it's just been, uh, it's just developed into something big. Now, there's some, the, girl, the woman in charge of it all who's amazing, Naomi Machete, who's easy oh, yes. to see. Yeah. So she, she's the person who got me involved. I know they've hired someone else, Finula O'Connor, who's volunteering with us as well, who's kind of in there like all the time helping. And there's a, there's a good team. And I'm working with um, a different rapper here, helping do the rap workshops. And the, as to be honest, we haven't even done much DJing yet, but yeah. that's that's the lead. Like, yeah. uh, 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 going back to what we were talking about earlier, we're doing loads of workshops where we're trying to just get them to write and express themselves. And, and even if it doesn't become like a release to whatever, um, it, it is, uh, even to just do it, it it's good, you know, oh, but you, yeah. well, we've recorded some of it already and yeah. there's some really cool stuff because it's all about, because I'm the one talking about it, but like it's their voices that are, there, their, it's their words, their voices, their feelings, uh, their expression, that's what's important. Yeah. 
it sounds remarkably special. And I mean, to me, as someone very interested in influencing policy and policymakers, it sounds like something that should be invested in, you know? Yeah. Um, particularly it's not my area of expertise, but yeah, and there is stuff happening. Like, yeah. That has some, some of it's been funded, like this yeah. project's. But particularly yeah. now as well, like you say, because the government after George Floyd has seen the need to respond to racism here, because mm -hmm. um, I presume you believe that it exists here, which, well, I do anyway, I think that we've plenty of racism of our own in Ireland that needs to be tackled and... Um, uh, unbelievably so. I mean, even, even someone who's actively on a street level, I'm even surprised the amount that I've learned since the George Floyd one, because that was a, a whole thing, a kind of like a, something that changed everything. But like loads of people I've been working with that I've known since they were 11 or 12 or 13 have only taught since then. Right. And so we did this webinar, which was quite, um, it got a lot of coverage and lots of people from the Ombudsman to people in secondary schools, Gardaí, all sorts of people came through. And lots of the young people that we worked with spoke and expressed stuff that they had, uh, lots of people had internalized. And even the people, because it was really interesting to me that like, there was stuff happening with, I was work like one of my nights is pretty much an Afro night. Like, it's called taboo. It's like literally like 80% Afro Irish. And some of the guys that I've been DJing for, year, for years, like stuff would happen. And, they were they never say anything. I, I was like, why don't and and I realized, especially the older generation, never wanted to ruffle feathers or yeah. they well, some people don't want to just get kicked out or just people yeah. think they could end up in prison. So there's loads of other stuff, but there's a younger generation now, and that's why we've connected up with lots of the other people who are doing like uh, the climate change youth activists here, or artivists as, as they're called. Uh, there's loads of other people, and they're not all from a migration background. Sure. You know what I mean? Uh, and they, and this generation of say 14 or 15 year olds, have actively shown already with the climate change stuff. They can get done, things done, and it's not like because when I was that age, then you know, I was like right on or whatever. But like, we weren't as, as likely to be going up the streets and actually be asking for change. We felt that like, oh. Uh, government is for all, older people and yeah. still we're, a lot of it is about it's about visibility and stuff that like like loads of stuff we're talking about we're, we're, we're doing lots of stuff uh bring, building education programs now that Fanula and people like that are doing in our group and lots of it is on like because there's not many like black teachers in Ireland and no. Bardi are judges and the media is still kind of like you know Bardi entertainers and that's always been another stereotype so look Things have to change, but um, I think the things are like things are on the agenda now. Like our things are, are moving, and even here, like the most main, like I, I, I write for the Echo. I do a column on hip hop, but like done it for about twenty years. But like they did this like um, anti racism series after the George Floyd take and I was like okay yeah like I'll write for you mm. I, I connected them up with loads of other people that they did loads of themselves but I thought it was going to be like kind of a three-week thing you know like yeah and even though they're still doing that and, and I'm looking at you no know, Facebook's the worst place to if you're ever gonna like look at comments on their right. stuff because you just can't like there's all sorts of like horrible stuff going on but even this week like I'm still like they're still they're looking for, like, they're, they're amplifying these voices. And yeah. Some people are reacting bad against it, obviously, because there's a lot of, we say, ignorance and that, or whatever. But like, there are people trying to at least uh, just kind of like listen a little bit more, and because these yeah. are the people you need to be listening to, like not me talking about it, it's them. Well, one of the things uh, um, as well that I learned from trauma is that, you know, if we feel unsafe, any of us feel unsafe around other people, it kind of gets in under our skin, into our bones and affects us. It makes us sick. And obviously racism, it, it makes people feel very unsafe around other people. Um, and as I, I interviewed Dr. Eben Joseph a while back, yeah. and she was saying an amazing woman doing phenomenal work. 
but like people of African origin in Ireland are a small percentage of the overall population. And so in order to have better opportunities and to be able to flourish, they do need the rest of us to kind of give a damn about their well-being, you know. So do you think we oh, big time. more like, education around the harms of racism in our schools and that type of thing, Stevie? Yeah, we're doing loads of stuff, setting up stuff in the schools, primary, secondary, because this is where, and like, obviously, like, I had a situation with a rapper here, and I heard him saying something, he's about 10, and I know that he didn't, like, that came from his, whoever his parents or whoever, yeah. and we corrected him, the other rapper who was involved in the project, literally, rather than giving out to him, so took him aside and said, look, and then he actually he actually learned from that scenario. Yeah. Like this is all like no one is born like no one is born looking at color or anything. No. So everyone's born. Do you know what I mean? What's a guy? What's a girl? What's gay? What's anything? So everything is like peace and love. It's the society is the thing that get, that, that, that 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 gets in the way. No, it's up to us to to change things. Uh, like education is the big thing. Like we work with our kids to first of all is try not to see it as like even for me it's like I get as much of it as, as anyone you know it's like we were I try to bring the joy and the, the music and the talent and the, the smiles and whatever because like lots of this cowardly stuff that's happening online you know what I mean you wouldn't say it to someone no there is there is a lot of that as well but um, there's so much ignorance and it's just uh, true, true, basically, like, I mean, I've always been about integ integration anyway, mm. um, but it, it's, you can do stuff through music, through arts, through football, mm. through anything that, that does help, um, I don't know, break down the barriers, but like, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but the we just try to amplify the, the voices that we're working with. And some of them, I would never try to put the pressure on them to be like, you know what I mean? We're not going up to a 12 year old girl and sort of asking her to be, um, you know, massively outspoken or anything like that. Like, you know, you just have to leave them to be themselves. Yeah. Uh, but some of them are getting into activism now and some of them have spoken up a lot lately and it is helping because even teachers are kind of turning around and going because certain stuff is systematic and, and like systematic. lots of lots lots of it is like our systemic is because lots lots of it is there's just stuff in place like and people have like i know the girls who are working with some of them are guys too and they've said stuff and it's been brushed away and it's been and that's just making things things worse, and 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 this whole situation is just I don't know. It's just um, it's quite complicated. But at the same time, I think education is one of the main things. And what we do then is uh, very complementary. All the music stuff, um, you know, it goes hand in hand with that. You know, just allow people to express themselves and. Mm give them a voice and just to, as you said earlier, just get their words out or whatever, mm -hmm. or their, their smiles or their dances or their, their swag or whatever it is. One of the other things that Eben said was that white supremacy means that we have a very um, narrow view of, of blackness and of the capacities of people of African origin. And a lot of it is negative or, you know, mm -hmm. Um, as you, you mentioned about poverty and famine and that type of thing. Or, um... Well, that's no, sorry, just to interrupt. That's one thing I was meant to say is like, that's one of the things that like we would do. I would always do with rappers. We were always saying like it's this whole thing about hip hop is American or whatever. We we're always saying, and it's finally happening now that there's rappers here with the, the car taxes, the limits happens, people are celebrating or whatever. But this whole thing, especially with Africa, and it's, it's like, it's not automatic, like, because I always look at Africa as being, like, cool and colourful and yeah. vibrant and, and just, like, with this, we, we're always trying to tell the, the kids to tap into their uniqueness, that if they are if they were born there, if their parents were born there, that they have this extra thing that, I, I always say to them, you've got more than me, you can speak more languages, yeah, you've got yeah. more, you live in more places, yeah. you've got, like, 
Tom's more um, ability to me. You've got like um, uh, stuff in your blood that's just like richer. Mm. So we always just try to tell them with their heritage, celebrate, and and it's totally understandable why people. Same with why Irish people have went abroad and tried to tone it down, even though yeah. ironically we've gone over and showed it about our culture all over the world, whether it's in Irish bars or whatever. And then even some of the, the right wing stuff here, it's like they're coming over here and invade and like pushing their country. Yeah, yeah. There's none of that. Like, and ironically, we've done loads of stuff with we've had our kids doing Irish dancing, loads of them could speak Irish, yeah. loads of them are like. In, in, like, I can't speak Irish. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so these people have they, their their accents are more Cork than mine. They can speak more. They're more Irish than than, than anyone. So and even the people who aren't born here, um, they're Irish too. If they're here, as far as I'm concerned. So this whole I don't know, but we are trying to tell them to celebrate that other, um, whether it's African or whether they're Syrian or whatever. Um, yeah, and that's have. really enriching us. Yeah. So it's enriching us here when there's like a restaurant, like a Palestinian restaurant, like cafe is or whatever. Or like we, we never seem to have a problem with all the, the Chinese and Italian restaurants over the years. It seems to be just like so so bring your food here, bring your culture. I mean what 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 a boring place it would be if we were just sitting here just like eating potatoes and just listening to whatever, like one kind of form of music and watching one kind of movie. And, yeah. But like this is the same way, like, it's enriching everything from sport to music to culture to arts, uh, education. And we're even learning more about, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. other cultures. So it's just, I mean, goes without saying that it's a, just a logical thing to you and me, but obviously there's people with defences and people always look to knock down the next person. If you look at the history in America of, like, the Irish went over on a certain level, not the level that some people are trying to pretend that we went over at, but we definitely did shoot down at the next level and sure. it happens. And yeah. No, it's it's all too human, unfortunately, one of the ugly aspects of, of, of being human. Um, one of the things though that I have found that since being a, a parent is that mm. I feel the injustices more because I can imagine my child experiencing that absolutely like it's horrific to me in a way that perhaps it wasn't before because I just can see the vulnerability of other children in my own and I don't want it for them you know um absolutely yeah no because if you for, that's the thing I always comes down to today it's kids like if you look at a kid and they're like how can you do that like how can Okay, like because again, I, I have an image of the, the kids that we do, and we work with really young kids too sometimes, and we see them, and it's just like these are just like the best kids. So, come on, like, and any kid, you know what I mean? Yeah. How can you so look, it's society does it's a thing that damages, but we're trying to bring it back to that, bring the not only the innocence back, but obviously the education, and just try to no, like you're. you're you're dead right, like as a parent, like how can you stand over? And and it brings it me to, to that thing that like for someone like me who works in music or whatever, I couldn't that you can't stand by and leave the so there's certain times when like obviously I don't want to amplify there's loads of stuff that I could stories I could tell about stuff that's happening in the background that I don't want to amplify because mm. but there is certain stuff that like I'd always stand up, you know what I mean? And and sometimes I know that even with my friends or with people online and people are kind of all like, Jesus, you're just doing some memes and that's funny, but like, why did you just come up with all this stuff about like, not about Black Lives Matter, but about anything. And mm. I'm like, for me, it's like, you just have to, so like, I, I do think we have, I, like, I, like, like there's certain stuff going on that like we have to like actively pull people aside. We actively have to just, stop like what I mean and don't get me wrong like when I was like I'm not like uh I'm sure I'm no angel like we've all done stupid things or probably said stupid things when we're younger or whatever I'm not trying to like dig into people's past and look for some something they wrote on Facebook when they were no, like, 15 or anything yeah but but there's times that you just have to kind of stand up like a big a big um publicized thing happened here with this this Dublin group versatile did some 
racial stuff. They were younger. Now they could have, they could have corrected themselves. They could have moved on. They could have done whatever, but they refused, first of all, to 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 deal with it. Um, and anyone, if you look at the history of music, people like the Beastie Boys, who are like one of these most socially conscious groups in the world, have actively done tons of stuff in Tibet and elsewhere. But they were brats when they were younger. And right. people, people, people don't expect people to be younger to be like, yeah. do you know what I mean? Um, and it's the same with the, even Eminem, eventually, you know, it was probably due to public pressure. Yeah. He eventually took back his homophobic stuff or whatever. And, you know, we could all grow, like, but like, if you and we can, di- and that's dig yourself in, like, yeah. we have to, like, because we all, like, even myself, like, you know what I mean? That, that whole white savior thing, as I said, I thought when we were younger, like, oh, I'm just giving money to, to people in Africa. We're brilliant. Like, and these people are, like, you're not seeing that, like, I don't know, it's just, I even see it now with the, the support set. And all well-meaning people are trying to support some of the stuff that we're doing because they see it and stuff. Yeah. And sometimes people are even, due to no fault of their own, yeah. are seeing it as some sort of, like, as I say, like it's it's not like the, the it's just the system has to change and, and and loads of other things. Yeah. But people people most people are good, you know. I mean I, I, I that. agree. But I do think um like in, in some ways a friend of mine said that, you know, in terms of say increasing integration or opportunities for for people of african origin in the workplace let's say yeah he's going the big company that he works for in the state they hardly have anyone from um poor neighborhoods in ireland it's all white middle class people he he would know no one from certain groups yeah. and so he was that was economics was the first barrier and then race comes after it like a lot of people just don't mix beyond they're, they're peer no. school or college, you know? Absolutely. Like, I was lucky in that regard myself. But, like, that's a perfect a perfect. Again, I keep going to America. And this is one of the reasons why, in America, there's a certain black America that looks down on, on other black America. Yeah. Economically. Yeah. And this is why, like, generations, and there's loads of this class situation, it's just, like, you, you nail it like it, it is an economic thing and that's 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 what the again that's what a lot of the the kind of commentary you you'll see from people online about like migrants and what are coming over here looking for their their, their whatever and it's like i'm like if do you know how much our government is spending on this direct provision thing you know what i mean it's making loads of people rich it's not the government are spending they're not making the profit on the system it's 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 uh, the money has been spent anyway, but spend it. Don't be giving it to some like uh, speculators or whatever. Um, but like ah, oh, uh, I'll actually get angry thinking about it. But the economical arts, you nail it. That's why change has to happen. You know, as I say, like I don't know anything about the legal system, but like you know, like like I can't imagine there's too many like non-white people. Uh, in that situation, or, or even teachers, you know what I mean? Mm. Things have to just so it's going to take obviously a, a, a time or whatever, but but um, you know, we, we've got to keep uh, keep just keep making people aware about it and doing our doing our very to us, I guess. Yeah. I've taken a lot of your time, Stevie, but just but maybe one last question, yeah, yeah, on your kind of political engagement, because you mentioned repeal the eight there, and I think I saw yeah. you around the place in your repeal jumper at various points and Definitely. talking and all of that. And I'm wearing my uterus prime one, which brilliant. Is also That's cool, actually. Time. But um, and obviously on Twitter you have the end direct provision hashtag. Would you describe yourself as a kind of politically engaged person or do you just get involved in certain campaigns because they kind of speak? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, like, because someone did something recently and they were describing, they said, activist, community activist. And I said, what's that? Like, <laughs> I don't, like I kind of saw it, but my image was of, of some guy who's going around actually doing stuff. Like, was funny. Right, I was doing stuff. stuff. 
I know, but it's different. Like, yeah. so I wasn't like handing out soup or whatever. The okay, I see. Are. And and the other thing is the activists is this other thing that like, people think it's someone running on with like bombs in, in Spain or whatever. <laughs> Extremists. <laughs> so I was just like, it's just natural. First of all, like there was like we've had such a great few years in some degrees because we had married referendum. So this was like the biggest no-brainer of all time. Yeah. So it was, but it was a campaign where the youth, and even though I'm not young, we I would consider myself as part of that group that it actually it yeah. really like that whole campaign was so good and then I didn't think the repeal thing would happen for because I remember being a kid when this whole stuff yeah. was being but actually it almost suddenly things got galvanized and things moved you know and sadly it happened it cost people like Savita or whatever yeah and, and all our sadly yeah like all these situations like avoidable situation but like to me this is just a whole brainer thing of like I'm a, I'm a guy like you know what I mean it's like this isn't my thing you know what I mean this is yeah. no this is my thing but this isn't my like it's not your isn't. body I don't exactly so yeah. it's simple it's just the most simple thing possible and I can totally agree that like it was more it was more um, complicated than my referendum because I, I can see sort of certain kind of arguments even like you know what I mean it's like well, like, and I can see how the extreme kind of thing, and so, but this, but, but when it goes to like people be outside hospitals and harassing people mm. and, and harassing women, basically. Yeah. And when I see all the mostly again men who were no, it was lots of women too, but again people latching on to um, really are latching on to the church and. Like, it was just something for me that, like, we really had to, like... And I remember getting a bit of, bit of stick or whatever. So it's nothing to me, like, you know what I mean? And uh, it was the least... But we really did, like, one of the one of the projects I do, Vinyl Love, which is all about the vinyl aesthetic and the history of it and the photography and stuff, as well as the music, because I have millions of records. Uh, so we used that as kind of almost that platform for marriage referendum, but then for repeal. And it got to the stage where we did for the repeal the eight. We did eight different cities, uh, including Manchester and London. Uh, we had a simultaneous events with DJs, cool. uh, um, just literally playing music and raising money and awareness. And there was so many other things we did, uh, but like we were only. But it was just this feeling of like you know. And when that happened and when it came through, it was just like, what a, what a moment. Yeah. But So special, yeah. But it also kind of helped, kind of, even for the direct vision and for some of the other stuff, it just kind of, you really feel that, like, you know, you can kind of, you can kind of change things a bit more. And that's why when I'm seeing the 15 year olds who are inspired by Greta or whatever, and, and I'm seeing these people, uh, so you're kind of going like you know things are actually moving and and and, and there's other stuff that we have to fight back against like, you know? yeah again it, i i'm not like try to be too aggressive on it or whatever but like i'll always stand up for for my, for what i think anyway yeah i wouldn't be the, the so i wouldn't be um the best person to express stuff or whatever else but uh i have a platform and definitely yeah. You can make a difference. Quite a so powerful that. platform, really, in reaching lots of different groups. Yeah. Uh, do you do you think we're close to ending direct provision, Stevie? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, see, it's just like it's like there's something going to change. All right, yeah, but um, again, it's it's like see, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough to to. But like there have been much better solutions that I can't express now, but it's just this whole, again, it's even, I don't know, like from the people I work with, um, this it's just simple stuff. Like it's just this feeling of, like for, for me, that we work with the biggest amount of teenagers apparently in direct provision is in Mill Street, in the whole country. Oh, right. And we, I work with say 20 or 30 of them and they're in Mill Street. We, okay, no, we can't do much, but we're doing, I was online with loads of them last night doing workshops or whatever. 
and there's we're I'm, I'm doing more with still with dance stuff down there. We've gone down to do the stuff there. We've done stuff down there, but it's 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 like 50, 60, 70 minutes away from here. Mm-hmm. And like these people, some of them are up studying, you know, and in fairness, the Cork Migrant Centre has helped facilitate travel for some of them. And, and these who are, like you just mentioned earlier, the barriers, like if it's not a girl of Mallow or Edie Bright, and she's, she got into UCC and she's trying to, or to get down, if she can't live here or whatever. But there's just extra barriers. And like, this is an Irish thing of like, you put it out into there, like 90% of the, the, the DP centres are in the country yeah. and further isolated. And cutting people off from certain opportunities. Like we work with all these artists, and in fairness to the clocks, man, I know they could play some corporate makers and all the people we work with have been amazing with bringing people up. But it's not the easiest thing to do, like this no. bossing people up the car and, and do. And so there's loads of stuff, and, and this whole thing of like people here. I don't think it should be a matter of a centre being built next door. It shouldn't be centres, you know what I mean, no. first of all. But, like, it's just should, should trying be, to... Be, be allowed to, like, live in homes for the, yeah, like, while, I mean, while their asylum application is being processed. Yeah, and, like, I'd, I'm not up on the legal stuff, mm-hmm. but I know from a cursory look that there's all sorts of just... Yeah. Just like, stuff going on that's just not good. But, like, yeah, I just... I know people that have just been in limbo for years, families, and just as you you said it best, like when you said barriers, you know, there's just extra barriers. Uh, people do all the extra stuff to to get to college, and then they have an extra barrier, and there's there's extra. But look, that's the way. Uh, but I think um, things will definitely things will definitely change. But I don't know. Um, <laughs> sorry. But, that the rest of us care enough about it. I mean, obviously, you and I and people in the human rights. Do they even know about it? Like, it's yeah. it's such a, like, people have, like, I was looking at, a, as I said earlier, the Echo are doing a series of combating racism. And they, 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 they and this one wasn't even, um, it wasn't the one that would normally trigger people. Because mm. the girl they have was French. She know, I know her. She's a model. She's brilliant. She works 24-7. She does tons of stuff. Aside from modeling mm. and dancing, and she's a drummer, she's brilliant. Mm. So she's French, and they had an article about her during the week. And I was looking at the comments under it, and all this like, people were like, Is This all again, because she's a migrant, or, or the whole like, first of all, people start saying, All oh, I hope she's she's not because she was also teaching, she's doing some, I don't know, I forget what the ins and outs of it were, but. To cut a long story short, there was people in reacting straight away, judging her because she's French. Saying, uh, I hope she's got better manners than the French normally have. And, right. and then there was the whole, there was all this line of like, people coming over here taking. And I'm like, if you look at wrong, have you gone up to Dell or Apple or whatever and look at the workforce there? Yeah. Like people giving us, and even if you go into your, your fast food places and the jobs that you wouldn't do anyway. Yeah. These are the people who are your services. And, and, and now I'm going to talk about, like, I don't eat meat. I never have done, but, like, and now I'm going to talk about the factories. And, yeah. And just the whole, like, this whole situation that we've got here that, like, people are, again, economic. People are looking at other people from a... And you even said earlier as well, when it comes to the... the the very economics of it lots of it is they're not looking and this is how people can compartmentalize in the uk for example i was like when the brexit thing was happening i'm like you're not caring about ronaldo or drogba or any of these yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know yeah. what i mean coming over and working <laughs> right. and it's the same here even we've got all these entertainers and we've got people who score a goal for ireland now yeah. and, and who, they can and, stay but the rest yeah. It's just this all, and I'm like, do you not realize that like, this is all like Ireland might actually, we might be winning World Cups and stuff like in, in 15 years' time when, when these people are in. No doubt, yeah, yeah. Um, and just this all, I don't know, but, but and lots of people here aren't even looking at it. Uh, like, I, one of the biggest guys, that, and I did try to talk him through it and mm. interact with him and, and rather than block him up, but one of the, the biggest interactions I've had with, with a guy who's definitely racist here 
one of his best, one of his friends is a friend of mine who's black. And I'm like, how can you stand over your thoughts when this guy here, your friend, yeah. is literally. And he's like, but I'm not right. And I'm like, you he looks at this guy and it's an economic thing because this guy yeah. is from a comfortable. I just, I don't know, like, so, so this guy is probably not even, I don't know, like, there's a certain fear that people have here. Yeah. Everything we know from, from the appeal, from marriage referendum, from homophobia, from any race, so lots of it is fear. And I suppose we really have to kind of get to the nux of what, what are they afraid of? Like, yeah. Lots of it is economic and this whole overrun thing. Remember I did two, I was doing a festival in the good times last year. I literally traveled to Donegal, which I've never, I'd only been there once before. I traveled there twice in one week, wow. longest drives. I was just driving up and down and up and down. As it say it was a probably 24 hours driving over two days, three days. And I was like, the whole country is just green like, on yeah. that Western strip. And I was like, and people are talking about it being overrun. And like we're going around Cork City here, and even like a small enough population, but like there's literally border up buildings everywhere. Yeah. So, and again, this whole bringing it back to your classic case here about what about the homeless? And I never see, and as someone who's worked with homeless and done stuff myself mm. on a low key level, the people who are sort of complaining about that all the time, I. I've, I've never encountered them. I know, yeah. <laughs> so, again, it's you now it could be in other people's interest to pick people against each other, too. Yeah. Like this whole stuff, like it's like, like this is a problem that we have to solve, our government, whoever yeah. has to solve it, but not at the expense. Like everything has to happen simultaneously. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that I'm sure uh, lots of people from migration background are. Be homeless as well, or are mm. homeless as well, and mm. these. So there's these whole. I don't know. I'm not it's the complex. one to solve everything, but yeah. it's but just pitting people against each other and always try to shoot down. Um, just it, it's yeah. it's frustrating. It is. But I tried to not get um too kind of frustrated as well. You know? No, I know. Well, it's it's unproductive, I guess. But the only thing that I or the biggest thing that I've learned is really we're all essentially the same. We need the same things to to be healthy and safe and to mm. flourish in the world, regardless of our gender or skin color or the rest of yeah. it, your know, belief system. And um, if we could only connect more about what we have in common, then yeah. it would be less. And even no, actually, exactly. And even the sorry, I interrupted you again. No worries. Even the um, the differences to celebrate them, like the yeah. unique thing. Well, that is what makes makes life fun mm -hmm. as well. Are the differences? You said it. Yeah, but um, just just one last one. Have you ever done any work with prisoners or people with with offending behaviour in their past? Because I imagine they'd love the DJing and hip hop and all of that. Ironically, back in the 90s, we used to, um, when we were on pirate radio, it used to go into the, the prison here, and we used to have a load, and it was mad, because it was yeah. that Tupac thing, yeah, yeah. my first ever pirate broadcast was the day Tupac actually died, so it was mad, the timing, that was 1996, but there was always that res, res in it, like, because people were, and people, like, Tupac did some horrible stuff himself, mm. uh, he changed in prison, mm. so this is why that system has to be so I'm working closely with a guy who's doing lots of stuff with prisoners here. He's a photographer. Uh, I have a friend of mine who, without getting into the details of it, came from one of the lowest situations to being uh, pretty high in the prison system himself. And a couple of friends of mine are working in that situation. So we've done lots. And actually, it gets, gets me back to, like, obviously... I'd like to, to do more in that regard, but we'll, because I think that whole reform thing is yeah. such a potentially, and again, it's you can't give up, you know what I mean? Yeah. But one of the things that we were doing before the lockdown, which is one of the biggest frustrations, at least the people with the mm. division are in that, that we're still working with, but mm. one of the, the, the groups we were working with were uh, in Clonakilty, Coach, and they were doing parties. I started doing a DJ workshop in the cabin, and there were adults with special needs or whatever, uh, who would be one of, again, never seeing it being talked about much because it's so far down the chain. Mm. And these people are talking about racial issues <laughs> this summer or this yeah. year. 
But this, these are people that like we physically can't work with. Now we're just, literally it's just DJing with the dancing or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it and also there's an extra barrier because they're not really as much online or whatever. So right. there's not like you know what I mean. Uh, but there's just so many. So then when I'm thinking like again, I don't have people in my family or whatever with special needs or whatever. Mm. But when you think of all the people, because we find everyday life challenging enough anyway, like the people, the carers, the people, people who are doing all this themselves, who are even more isolated. So you're just thinking about um, like bringing um, a bit of love and life to their work. Yeah, but how how this pandemic has oh, yes, made it so much harder for yeah. so many people, and services being kind of just like, but it's mad. But, but to go back to your thing, like, I mean, yeah, like, I think the, the was there a project that we were going to be doing? Yeah, it's, it's definitely something I think um, might might end up trying to do more of, but I've done, like, little I reckon little it would bits, go but, down. But I haven't gone in. It would yeah. really go down well, I think, you know. Yeah. They'd be clamouring for your classes, because it would be a bit yeah. of fun and again, self-expression and just, you know, cultivating mm. talents and then having yeah. some maybe to go when they get out, you know, as well, if there are other. No, absolutely. Because lots of it, I mean, if you look at even the biggest, lots of the biggest rappers in the world have gone through that system and used it and yeah. mind it, to be yeah. honest. But uh, there, there is a good friend of mine who works quite actively in the UK and here uh, with that system. And again, he's had guys that, like some of the worst have come out and turned it around and yeah. some of them have, have turned it around through art and photography yeah. and other stuff it's quite no. interesting no doubt well look Stevie thank you so much for your time I took way more than I, I thought yeah. <laughs> probably and you not in any way so but going. I really enjoyed it it was great chatting to you and thanks so much for all the amazing stuff that you do you know it's really yes. very and it's I'm doing my uh I'm doing my taxes today, so yeah, well, I'll, I'll talk for forever. So. Enjoy that, so um, can't wait. Thanks a million. But this was how to talk policy and influence people with me, Jane Mulcahy, and my wonderful guest Stevie G. Um, take it easy and mind yourself, Stevie. Thanks for having me. <laughs>